audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. The story. The day I left prison and I walked out the gates, it was like God had just thrown something at me. And he was saying to me that my time with women in prison wasn't done. And I remember being petrified when I heard that from him because there was no way in the world I was going back inside them gates, Eric. G'day, I'm Jimmy Colfax. Welcome to The Story. Well, today, once again, Mel Wells is joining us to tell more of her amazing story of transformation. Last time, we heard how she had been abused as a child and how this trauma led her to become a compulsive liar as she was constantly seeking approval. Also, she was later told she had a disassociative identity disorder, which is sometimes referred to as multiple personality disorder. She described it as being like hearing two voices in her head. This eventually led Mel to convince herself that she had a serious illness and was raising funds to pay for her unneeded medical treatment. Ultimately, she was put in prison for fraud. When we ended last time, she'd begun to meet with the ladies from Cairo's prison ministry. Now, we'll hear what happened next in her life when she did an activity with them during a short course they were providing. Once again, Mel Wells is chatting with Eric Scadabo. And we had to talk about forgiveness. And then on this paper, we went on our own and, and we had to write a list of people that we had to forgive. So I did. I wrote my name and then I wrote the abusers' names and, and a few other names. And then we sat in a little chapel service that we had and they had worship music in the background and we had um, holy water and we had to go up and pray over the paper and then we put the paper in, which dissolved in, in the holy water. And it was at that time that I felt Jesus literally lift this massive burden out of my, my body. Mm. as I watched that paper dissolve in that holy water. And that, that was a game changer for me. So it was feeling loved by, by something and someone that I had, I had no understanding of, really. Mm. It was like, what is all this about? Why, why do these ladies come in every week? And, and like the compassion, the love, like the non-judgment, mm. um, just a different way of life. It's like, what have they got that I haven't got? What, what am I lacking? Mm-hmm. And and it was Jesus. It was you know it was it was Jesus. And it was that day that I realised that that was what I was lacking, and and I needed to learn more about who He was and 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 who He was to me. And yeah, everything everything changed for me that day. It was amazing to, you know, it was like a flick of the switch for me. I suppose in a way where my outlooks on life were starting to change, my attitude towards life and towards other mm-hmm. people. Um, I had a lot of hatred in me before mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. a lot of anger and and that just sort of subsided and you know like I I used to say that I hated people and you know things like that where that all started to change and even today like you know hate's a very strong word and and I don't hate anybody mm. um including them two men from my childhood you know mm. yeah it's 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 an amazing gift to be able to feel to feel Jesus's love in your heart and did that help you psychologically as well yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I found that it was just like the other voice had disappeared that I was hearing and it was just one voice and it was my voice and, mm-hmm. and you know, and, and I started to be able to understand what was really going on with me and, and be able to express that more in, in when I spoke to people about it and, mm-hmm. and unpack different things and know that it was okay to talk about things that I'd compressed or, you know, I'd have nightmares or dreams or visions of things that had happened and, and start talking about it and going, oh, wow, that did really happen and, you know, how do we fix this and, and how do I make me be a better person? And, and I had that, that help. And I'm, I'm taking it that the compulsive lying stopped. You didn't feel the need to lie for approval anymore. Yeah. Yeah. It definitely did. It, um, it, it was, it was a big game changer doing that Kairos short course that I did in the prison. Um, just, yeah, completely turned my life around. It helped me to be the person that I am here today. Um, mm. Lying is definitely something that I don't do anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I, I upset people sometimes because I'm so truthful with mm. what I say, mm. which can be a bad thing, <laughs> I suppose, to some people. But, you know, it's all about being honest and, and being true to Jesus. Mm-hmm. And when did you put your faith in Jesus? How did that happen? Um, well, I think mainly that day was when I sort of, 
I went back to my room after that that day and, and I cried and, and Bernard had actually given me a Bible and I opened it and, and I closed my eyes and I prayed and, and I said, you know, Jesus, okay, you you need to take control. I, I'm starting to understand what you're about and, and I know that you forgive me, but you need to help me. Mm. I, I need to understand you and I need to understand what you want me to do to be a better person. And I understand that radio played a part in your growth as a Christian. Yeah, so after that, um, I had a... Something like I'm a, very a happy little, to hear. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had a little Walkman um, given to me while I was in prison and some headphones. So overnight, I started listening to a, a Christian radio station in, in prison, mm-hmm. and um, I'd fall asleep listening to um, different stories of a night and, and worship music. And then on a Saturday morning I'd, with another inmate, I'd actually go around and, and walk laps around the compound, and mm-hmm. I'd have the earphones in my ears listening to to the christian radio station and and it, it helped me keep going and and i'd um yeah and i really enjoyed listening to the music i, I preferred to listen to the worship music than other music and, and that's still the same today mm-hmm. um i have different christian mixes on my phone that i will listen to before i listen to anything else which is a big change from how i used to be the old me now let's talk about your husband what role did he play in all of this um, so Rod, he, um, he stayed behind. So he's not, he's not the father of any of my four kids. Mm-hmm. Um, but when I went to prison, he, he stood up and, and he looked after, um, three of the four. The older boy was away, um, in Brisbane, uh, mm-hmm. attending his final years at school. So Rod hung back with the other three and he, um, he helped raise them for the time I was away. And then when, when I came home, we sort of, sat together and said, okay, we want to try and make this work. And, and he's seen the change in me mm-hmm. and he, he was happy about that. So, yeah, so we, um, yeah, we just continued on with our relationship and, and we grew stronger together and, and he wasn't a Christian either. Mm-hmm. And we found a local organisation in Lismore uh, that holds a, holds a church service on a, on a Sunday morning. Um, it's called the, the Lismore Soup Kitchen, mm-hmm. uh, also known as the Winsome. It used to be an old pub. And um, we started attending church there on a Sunday morning and, um, yeah, and it just all sort of sort of blended from there and we got married in, in 2021. Um, our love is probably stronger than it has ever been, but, yeah, obviously having Christ in our life makes, makes a world of a difference. And he put his faith in Jesus as well? Yeah, he um he comes to church on a Sunday with me um, and he believes and, and he often says to me, oh, we need to pray about this and, Mm. I have a bit of a giggle when he says it sometimes because it's like you look at our life seven, six years ago and <laughs> you would never have heard us say something yeah. like that, you know. I'm sure for the old the old friends and that that don't have anything to do with us now, um, if they heard us talk the way we talk today, they'd be thinking, oh, there's something going on here. <laughs> you know, um, total turnaround for both of us. Yeah, your lives have changed so much. Yeah, completely, completely, um, you know. And, I mean, we, we have times, Eric, where we miss – the people that were in in our lives beforehand um but well that's the reality that some people have just completely cut you out of your lives yeah 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 um and it was really hard for him too because mm. you know he had so many friends and family that sort of went well it's it's either her or us and and he chose me how did that make you feel very very sad very sad um it was a very hard time and yeah, it it played a big impact on on our love. Um, I didn't think we'd even make it, to be honest. I thought he'd walk away, um, mm. but he didn't. And and it's good to today because he's actually just started to reconnect with a couple of them their mates of his. They've actually oh, okay. reached out to him and and caught up a couple of times with him. So that that's good to see that you know that that's happening for him. It, it's making him happy. Yeah, but he took care of your children. They weren't biologically his children. But he became their father while you were in prison. Correct. Yeah. So, I mean, him and I had been together for a while previous to me going to prison. Um, yeah. So, yeah, we, we got together in 2012. So, my youngest was only a baby. Um, okay. So, we'd been together for a while before yeah. I'd yeah, been incarcerated. But still, it was a big job. Like, you know, and yeah. it biologically wasn't his kids. Right, exactly. A um, lot easier for him to walk away and, and not deal with any of that. Um, exactly. But he faced it. He he faced it head on, and and you know he he, he strived to be to be a good man, and and that's what he did, and and he continues to do that today. And is he growing as a Christian? Yeah, definitely, mm-hmm. definitely. Um, when I came home from prison, like I wanted to work 
and keep busy. And that was really hard being in the small community we were in because everybody knew who I was and what I'd done. Mm. So he he went and got himself an ABN and, and I went and did some house cleans up for him and um, just started a little cleaning business. And that cleaning business grew to today where we've got – well, he had to actually leave his full-time job to take over and help with the cleaning because oh. it just, yeah, just blew out of the water. Um, oh, okay. God definitely provided for us and, and now we have, you know, we do commercial cleaning, domestic cleaning. We have six or seven staff that are underneath us now. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, so life is, is definitely good for us today. You're listening to The Story. Our guest today is once again Mel Wells, who put her faith in Jesus while she was in prison. We'll hear how she's now helping other women who are in jail when we return. The Story. If this program has highlighted something you'd like prayer for, we'd love to pray for you. Call 1-800-PRAY-FOR-ME. That's 1-800-772-936. It's a free call. Or text 0401 132 888. Hi, I'm Jimmy Colfax and this is The Story. We're back with more of Mel Wells sharing how her life has been completely transformed after she put her faith in Jesus while in prison. Next, we'll find out how she's helping other women after they're released from jail as she continues her chat with Eric Scadabo. Okay, so let's go back a little bit, back to when you're in prison, you're mm-hmm. growing as a Christian, and then you get this vision of how to help other women who were in jail. Yeah, I um, the day I left prison and I walked out the gates, it was like it was like God had just thrown something at me, and He was saying to me that my time with women in prison wasn't done, mm-hmm. and I remember being petrified when I heard that. From him because there was no way in the world I was going back inside them gates, Eric. Um, yeah, you know, it was it was. Well, hard. Once you're out, you were it just was, gone, and and who would yeah, blame you? Yeah, yeah, and and the, and the sad thing was though, in that time I was in there, I seen a lot of women come and go, mm. um, like nine, ten women, and I remember watching them come back inside weeks later, thinking, "Why are you back? Like, what is going on here? What? Why would you choose to come back here instead of living life on the outside?" So he gave me a strong vision of I'm going to help them, but he didn't give me much more than that. And I remember telling a few people about it and anyway, and just sort of let it go and and didn't think much of it. And it wasn't until later on in 2022, my mum had passed away suddenly. She became very ill Hmm. and I got severe anxiety and and a bit of depression from it and and couldn't face people and things like that. So after a few months, I, I pushed myself to go back to church and I sat in the back at, at the Winsome and heard a guy who's actually on our committee today for Desert Road talk about another organisation called the TRC, which is the Restoration Centre. Mm-hmm. And it's a, a it's a place for men that go. Um, it's a Christian faith based for men coming out of prison or they can be bailed there. And what they do there is amazing. And when Don was telling the story, it was like I had Jesus sit next to me and he tapped me on the shoulder and he said, hear this. He said, this is what you need to do mm-hmm. for the women. This is the vision. Mm-hmm. And it was that day that I just I felt so compelled to help these women better themselves when they come out. And at the end of the day, Eric, it's all about, one, it's about opportunity, but more than anything, it's about love. And mm-hmm. that's a big thing that lacks for a lot of people that leave prison is they don't have the love and support that they need to help be on, get onto the right path when they leave prison. Well, that, that's... Uh Interesting that, you know, there's so many problems, psychological problems and reasons why people are in prison, but you're saying that a lot of it comes down to just love, just being loved, yep. having something to love yep. them. Yeah, exactly. And and show them, like, you know, help them mm-hmm. make decisions and, and know right from wrong and seek the right help mm-hmm. if they need help. That's That's an important one for them as well, like I did. Like I continued when I left prison, I continued seeing a psychologist up until last year, mm-hmm. um, and she was fabulous, you know. But it's it's all about helping other people, and and I could see that you know Jesus had built this thing with the TRC, 
and and the people that work there and, and volunteered there and the work they went, I went and checked it out and the work they did was amazing and I was like, okay, now how, what do you want me to do? Like what's the vision, God? And and I did a lot of praying mm-hmm. um, and I got together with some, some amazing people that are very close friends and well, their family to us. And they sat with us and, and they said, okay, let's let's try and turn this vision into a reality mill. So how can so we what, help? So what specifically was your vision? I know you wanted to help to, them, but in what way? To be able to help women come out of prison and be given a, a, a fresh start in life like mm-hmm. I was without mm-hmm. the judgment and be surrounded by a community of love and compassion. I, I wanted to give people what I have, have received. Mm-hmm. So it was more like, I suppose in a way, it's paying it forward. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And, and wanting women to to feel the way I felt when I came out and, and had the opportunities that I had to to be a better person. And, and I find that that's one of the most important things for both men and women. And, I mean, Eric, when I when since I've been out, like I've obviously made some friendships with some of the women in prison mm-hmm. and four of them in particular over the last five years have taken their own life. Mm. Um, and every time that I get a phone call or I, I get a letter or an email about something like that, it just it, it cuts cuts deep because it's why did this happen and, and how can this be prevented? And, mm-hmm. you know, a lot it's yeah. lack of support. Yeah. So you had the vision and how did you make it reality? What were the steps that you had to take? Um, so we go underneath the Lismore Soup Kitchen, who mm-hmm. I'm a big part of. Um, we formed a committee. Mm-hmm. Um, with my mentor Ian, he's on the committee, and and the bells, the that are like parents to me, and a few other people are on there. And so there's all accountability. So if anybody is questioning whether you're trustworthy because of what happened in the past, you are accountable to a board. Very much so, and that was mm-hmm. one of the biggest important things to me was to mm-hmm. make sure that you know everything was above board and. Mm-hmm and in control and it's not just me there's a as an organization we're a non-profit charity mm-hmm. um and we're very well known up here for for the work that that happens at the soup kitchen and um so yeah so we formed a committee um and then ian and i did a lot of traveling we went to melbourne we actually caught up with um tim costello mm-hmm. who's a friend of the bells um and a bloke by the name of kevin maddick who was a chaplain in the prisons in melbourne for many years mm-hmm. Um, we got some input off them. We went to Sydney. We caught up with people from Corrections New South Wales and said, this is what my vision is. This is what I want to do. Um, we had a lot of support throughout the country with, with what, what we wanted to do. Um, we put together some volunteers and, and said, okay, this is, this is what I want. And, and do you think this can help or what can, what can you do? So we came up with the idea of, of finding accommodation for, for women to come out. Mm-hmm. Um, and helping them with different needs. So one of their big things is goal setting. Mm-hmm. And I found for myself personally, when with my experience when I left, that if I set goals and, and tick them off each week, it sort of helped you want to keep moving forward um, and mm-hmm. seeing that you are improving and, and things like that. So, yeah, so the whole idea of it, so we've called it Desert Road. Mm-hmm. And as I said, we're a non-profit organisation and the name has been... I, we picked the name after a song by Casting Crowns um, and when people look through the Bible and you, and you see about the desert and, and, you know, Jesus went and, you know, how he, you know, obviously fought with, with Satan at, during that time and mm-hmm. his 40 days and things like that. Mm-hmm. And it was funny how Christ works, Eric, because in my prison journal I've actually got written in there a few times about how I've compared my time walking in prison to walking in the desert. Mm-hmm. So it's just it reflected on me and and Ian and I were driving home from a, a church conference one day and I said to him, I think this name suits, what do you think? And anyway, we have a bit of a giggle because he says, as long as we spell it with one S and, and not two. <laughs> and, um, yeah. So, yeah, I had to make sure I had that spelled of, right when I was typing yeah, up your dessert. notes here. Because <laughs> <laughs> we both love dessert. So. <laughs> yes. um, so, yeah, so we named it Desert Road. And, and one of our volunteers, they um, they actually came and sat with me and asked what, you know, what Desert Road looks like to me. And I explained how I, I picture a woman walking along the desert road and next to her is another set of footprints, and obviously that foot pr- then footprints are Jesus walking mm, with her. Yeah. So even though you, you may not see him, you definitely feel him. Yeah. When I um, kind of have the image of a desert, 
you're thinking of people being thirsty and in need and despondent. Is that kind of what you're going for? That's exactly it. So you're bringing the love of Jesus, the water of life that never runs out and quenches thirst eternally. You're bringing that to uh, people coming out of prison. Do I have that yeah. right? Yeah, we are. Definitely right. Spot on. It's um, it's a great thing that, that we've got going. We had our first woman join us eight weeks ago mm-hmm. now. Oh, so this is very fresh. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So she's, she's doing a great job. Um, she's attending different courses that she needs to attend to help better herself. She does goal setting every week. She mm-hmm. volunteers at um, local soup kitchens and pantries. Um, she goes to a Indigenous art class once a week. She does art with our volunteers because some of our volunteers have a good artistic bone. Mm-hmm. And um, she attends church with us as well on a Sunday morning um, and, and loves it, enjoys a time with the volunteers. And is your husband involved as well? Yeah, he comes and helps out where he can. And, you know, even my kids, my kids come and, and spend time with her when I'm around with her as well. And and she loves feeling loved. She loves mm. feeling like she's part of a family. Just simple, down to basics, loving people. Exactly right. And, you know, and love love conquers all. I, one of the, one of the um, big Bible verses that stuck to me was, um, you know, 1 Corinthians 13 about love, you know, mm-hmm. verse 4 to 8, you know, that, that love conquers everything, you know, and it does. It, and I'm proof of that, that you can turn your life around if you really want to do it. Sometimes you just need that bit of love and support to help you, to help you do that. And for you, it was the, the chappy and uh, the ladies that ran the Kairos group? Correct. And, you know, and the people that I have around me today. I mean, mm-hmm. like uh, this year I'm in my third year of um, studying, mm-hmm. uh, which is my final year of theology. I'm about to be endorsed as a, as a local chaplain. Oh, okay. Um, Coming full yeah, circle. So things, yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I'm, I'm part of a Lismore business chaplaincy group, the mm-hmm. um, Disaster Recovery Chaplaincy Network. So. Mm-hmm. If there's a disaster and, and things like that that happen in the area, I get called to that. Um, so, yeah, so life is definitely different for me oh, today yeah. Yeah. to how it used to be. Mm-hmm. And what are your final reflections on your whole story arc? I mean, you've come from such a bleak past and, well, the, the trauma and the disorder that you had. What are your reflections on all this that has happened to you? Um, some people say to me, that see me from my past life, they're like, Do you, are, you, are you sorry for what you did? Mm-hmm. And I say, I'm definitely sorry for what, what has happened. Mm-hmm. Um, there's no, no doubt about that. But the thing is, Eric, if I hadn't have gone through the journey I'd gone through, I wouldn't be here today and mm-hmm. be the person that I am doing the things I'm doing. And I believe that God has a plan for everybody. Mm-hmm. And sometimes in the darkest moments, we can't see what that plan may be, but looking back one of the big things that i take out and i find it important and i share it with anyone when something's going on and it's affecting you you need to talk about it doesn't mm-hmm. matter who you talk to about it whether mm-hmm. it's a spouse or a friend or a counselor well hopefully somebody trustworthy correct yeah um because talking things out is is very important and mm-hmm. it's crucial especially if it's something that's serious and it, and it helps people helps people move on instead of compressing stuff mm-hmm. because Obviously, especially given my circumstances, not dealing with anything head on is, is just not good for you. Unfortunately, humans being what we are, we sometimes need to reach rock bottom before we look to God. Yeah, um, and I definitely reach that. And, you know, it's, it's sad because, you see, we deal with people daily in our area that, that are disadvantaged or, or are homeless or, or face drug or alcohol addictions and and you want to help them and, and and we do we try to help them as best we can but but I suppose the thing is as well that unless you want to help yourself it's mm-hmm. it's not gonna it's not gonna change for you yeah um, but yeah they it, have to decide it's a simple yeah correct and you know and when the time is right that you just hope that you know it's not too late and and you can help them as well mm-hmm well, I am so happy to hear how the Lord has worked in your life. Sorry to hear everything you've gone through with the trauma of abuse in your childhood and prison and all that. But as you've mentioned, the Lord has worked in your life and 
maybe this was what needed to happen in order for him to get your attention. And so thank you so much for sharing your story and how the Lord has worked in your life. Thank you for sharing that with us today. Thank you, Eric. I appreciate it. I don't know where this is going, but I know who holds my hand. It's not the path I would have chosen, but I'll follow you to the end. But as long as I am breathing, I will make your glory known. Even if it means I'm walking on this desert road. Well, that's a bit of the song Desert Road by Casting Crowns, which inspired the name for Mel Wells' ministry. Her Desert Road ministry focuses on supporting women who have been released from prison and helping them to begin a new life. For more information, the website is desertroad.org.au. Once again, that's desertroad.org.au. And we'll end today with some of the lyrics of the song Desert Road. It says, Lord, where you lead me, I will follow. So many desperate souls in need, where you lead me, I will follow. I'll walk with them as you walk with me. You're the living water to the thirsty on this desert road. And that pretty much sums up Mel's desire to help other women be set free, like she was set free in prison. We pray that she continues to grow in her faith and helps many others come to Jesus. Well, thanks for joining us for part two of Mel Wells' inspiring story. Until next time, I'm Jimmy Colfax, encouraging you to share your story with someone today. The story. the story. Just another way vision is helping you look to God daily. Thanks for taking time to listen to this audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. To find out more about us, go to vision.org.au.